to turn up the pulpit mic, Brother Pierce. The the not the not the one in here, but the two lighter gray dials that feed the uh, the live stream. Turn those to about the three quarter mark, because otherwise it'll be just a little bit quiet on live stream. And uh, <laughs> I've been uh, I've been working that on that, and uh, I usually remember, but I forgot. Um, so. All right, let's turn in our Bibles to uh, Ephesians chapter 3, the uh, book of Ephesians in chapter 3. I want to look at a few uh, a few verses here and uh, something that the Apostle Paul said to the church at Ephesus that jumped out at me while I was reading my Bible this week and I um, and, uh, wanted to look at that together. Let's also go ahead and stand for the reading of God's Word this evening. The Bible says in Ephesians chapter 3, starting in verse 13, Wherefore I desire that you faint not at my tribulations for you, which is your glory. For this cause I bow my knees unto the Father of our Lord Jesus Christ, of whom the whole family it in heaven and earth is named that he would grant you according to the riches of his glory to be strengthened with might by his spirit in the inner man, that Christ may dwell in your hearts by faith, that ye, being rooted and grounded in love, may be able to comprehend with all saints what is the breadth and length and depth and height, and to know the love of Christ, which passeth knowledge, that you might be filled with all the fullness of God. Now unto him that is able to do exceedingly are exceeding abundantly above all that we ask or think, according to the power that worketh in us, unto him be glory in the church by Christ Jesus throughout all ages, world without end. Amen. Let's pray. Heavenly Father, I thank you so much for this evening. Lord, I thank you for your word. Heavenly Father, have your hand on the service tonight. Holy Spirit, work through the word in our hearts and in our minds and in our lives and speak to us. Um, Lord Jesus, be with us tonight. Lord, we ask all of these things in Jesus' name. Amen. You may be seated. Um, I misread this verse the first time I read it. Um, how, how many of you have ever done that? Read a verse that it said something and you thought it said something different than what it was saying. So when I first read this verse, um, by the way, they, they, they've got these, these new little, like, mini cough drops, Paul's, like, mini cough drops and like, a little, uh, a little, um, Tic Tac container. That's awesome. That's amazing. Um, they're like three bucks, though, which is a little expensive, but, uh, <laughs> maybe the price will come down. Um. I misread this verse the first time I looked through it because I, I thought it said, um, wherefore I desire that you faint not at the tribulations for you, which is your glory. That's not what it says. I thought it was an exhortation, you know, faint not tribulations are coming. You're going to go through some things, faint not. Right. And the Bible does say that and that message and lesson is th all throughout scripture. But that's not what this says. This says, Wherefore I desire that you faint not at my tribulations for you, which is your glory. And so I, I looked ahead, behind to what Paul was talking about, and what was he talking about? Well, he was talking about um, some things that he was suffering, and also some things he was going through, and also some things that God had given him. He says in, in verse 1 of chapter 3, For this cause I, Paul, the prisoner of Jesus Christ for you Gentiles. So we understand that the Apostle Paul is writing this as a prisoner. Um, generally it is held that he was a prisoner at Rome at the time of the writing of the book of Ephesians. That is, is generally to be understood. Um, and, uh, and, and so... We, we see that Paul was a, a prisoner here, and, and Paul went through a lot of things in the ministry. We also see that a great burden was placed on him, right? Um, that, that 
the, this ministry was placed on him, the ministry of taking the gospel to the Gentiles, we see that this ministry, this responsibility, though, was not only perceived by Paul as a responsibility, but as a grace given to him, a gift, a, uh, a, a privilege. Um, and so we, we see that, that that uh, that this grace was given to him that he should preach among the Gentiles the unsearchable riches of Christ, verse eight, um, and so he acknowledges his suffering, and then reminds them of the goodness of God, and then he says this to them: Wherefore I desire that you faint not at my tribulations for you, which is your glory. What's Paul saying here? He's saying, don't get stressed out about how much I'm doing for you. And this is something that we do um, in, in life, in relationships with people. See, um, humans are reciprocal by nature. It's the way God's made us, right? Somebody does good for us, we want to do good in return. We have uh, uh, affections and carings and um, we, we have exchanges of, of good and there's in, in most relationships, even in a relationship that's built and based around love and familial affection and caring, there is also an expectation of re reciprocity, right? That's, that's built into us. It's how we're wired, right? And so a child who grows up with parents who take care of them has an expectation in themselves by nature to love and care for those children. By the way, um, parents, uh, y y you know, sometimes we, uh, when our, our children don't obey us or uh, respect us or give us what we think we deserve from them as, as parents in, in our authority, it's because we have not shown them the love and caring and nurture of God in their lives. And so, um, y you know, our, our children don't, respond to us not because they're bad children but because we are not what we should be as parents and the, the the answer is to be who we should be as parents right um that's a side note it's free um the whole thing's free i guess but uh <laughs> um but we have an, an expectation of reciprocity what that means in in one nature is we by nature, in a lot of areas, in a lot of respects, we do not like receiving things that we feel are unearned. We do not like seeing people who we care about go through trouble for our sakes, right? Um, you think about that. Uh, if somebody buys you something, oh, you didn't have to. You know, there's, there's gratitude, but there's also a little embarrassment, right? That somebody bought you something, especially if it's something very expensive. You feel uncomfortable with the gift. You feel embarrassed by the gift, right? Um, when somebody does something for you and that something, if, if, even if it's not financial, or maybe more if it's not financial, but it is of great cost to them in some other way, that gift of theirs toward you is of great emotional cost, a great cost in labor and trouble. And, uh, you know, most people, when they give gifts out of a genuine heart, they actually go out of their way to make sure that the person they're giving the gift doesn't see the cost of it, right? That's, that's a part of our nature as well, and that's a, that's a good thing. That's a respectable thing. But sometimes you can't help but see that. Sometimes you can't help but figure that out. And there's an embarrassment over what somebody does for you. And this is what the Apostle Paul is talking to these Ephesians about. He's talking about all that he is doing for them and all that he is giving them and giving up for them. All the effort and labor and struggle that he has poured into these people. And he tells them, don't, don't, don't faint about that. Don't struggle with that. Don't wrestle with that. These things I do are, 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 are your glory. They are to your benefit. They are to uplift you. They are for you to 
rejoice in. And he says to them that they need to receive that. Um, this is, this is a, this, it, 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 it was, like I said, this is a, this is a weird, um, a, 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 an interesting or unusual phrase. It's an interesting and unusual concept in scripture. Um, but it's, it's something to, to recognize and to understand. Um, when someone is doing the will of God, and they're suffering for the will of God, for us, then the response should not to be to take away that blessing that they are receiving in, in serving. Um, and so that's one reason we might faint at somebody's tribulation for us. When, when they are struggling or striving or going through hard times for our sake, um, that we that we sometimes you know, we, we want them to, to lay off. But if God's called them to what they're doing, they need to do that. And they are receiving a blessing in that in that struggle. And what what the Apostle Paul tells them here, I think, is is one of the keys to understanding and and um receiving that in the right way is that we have to get close to God so we understand and receive a calling to do the same. See, um, properly living as a family in Christ means sacrificing for one another. It means giving for one another. It means, in some cases, suffering and going through tribulation for one another. And look, I, that's not my nature any more than it is yours. Like, I, I've got people who it is my nature to suffer for, right? <laughs> Um, it, it is, it is in a parent's nature to suffer for their children. You know, that, that's, that's, that's hardwired into us. It's in our biology. It's written in our DNA. Um, the parent who doesn't do that is the aberration, right? Parents who, who don't properly love their children are abnormal. Um, that's, that's as natural to, uh, you know, lost, saved, Christian, non-Christian, out there in the world, wherever, Parents love their children by and large, and, and abusive, unloving, you know, callous, selfish parents, that's, that's unnatural. Um, but what's supernatural is to take that love, the love of God, the love that he gives us, and extend it beyond our biological family, first to the family of God, to the church, to those around us, our brothers and sisters in Christ, and then beyond that, to the world around us, and to the people that Christ died for. And what the Apostle Paul teaches here, here here's what he says. Um, for this cause, I bow my knees unto the Father of our Lord Jesus Christ. What cause? Well, he's about to tell us. Of whom the whole family in heaven and earth is named, that he would grant you, according to the riches of his glory, to be strengthened with might by his spirit in the inner man, that Christ may dwell in your hearts by faith, that ye, being rooted and grounded in love, may be able to comprehend with all saints what is the breadth and length and depth and height, and to know the love of Christ, which passeth knowledge, that you might be filled with all fullness of God. So that's, that's one long sentence there, right? That's one long statement with a, a, a lot of clauses attached to it that, that amend it. But what he gets down to here, what is he bowing on his knees for? That Christ may dwell in our hearts by faith, and that being rooted and grounded in love, we may comprehend and know the love of Christ. And so... Um, when, when, when the Apostle Paul talks of his suffering, and he talks of the grace given to him in this ministry that he is called to, and the gift of it, when he tells them that he doesn't want them to faint at his tribulation, how are they going to not faint at his tribulation? How are they not going to feel embarrassed by the suffering that he endures for the sake of, of serving them? Well, 
the, the way they're going to do that is to themselves understand the heart of God and to themselves understand the ministry that Paul is called to because when they understand that ministry, they'll understand and see it from his perspective. And from his perspective, he's not suffering. He is blessed beyond all measure to be given the grace and the gift of that ministry that he has given to them. And um, and when they see that from his perspective, they will, uh, they will be strengthened in the inner man. And so let's, we'll, we'll, we'll walk through these verses here. Um, it says in verse 17 that Christ may dwell in your hearts by faith. And so what do we have to have in this, in this situation? We have to have faith, right? We have to have a, a belief and an understanding and a trust in God, an active and living faith, a substantial and evidentiary belief um, in, in God, right? Uh, in, in the book of Hebrews, it's chapter 11. It says that faith is the substance of, substance of things hoped for, the evidence of things not seen. Faith is our substance and evidence. That means it, it has um, something beyond just the, the metaphysical existence, but is actually something substantial, physical, uh, something visible. That's, that's why James said, you know, show me thy faith without thy works, and I'll show thee my faith by my works, Right? Um, faith that does not produce works is, is just imagination. It's just a belief in something. It's, it's knowledge. It's understanding. It's not real faith. Faith produces action. And, uh, and what he says here is, is that Christ may dwell in your hearts by faith. And so a faith, a belief, um, and that faith, by the way, is a gift of God. In, in verse 16, going back, that he would grant you according to the riches of his glory to be strengthened with might by his spirit in the inner man, uh, that Christ may dwell in your hearts by faith. Right? So th these are a, a couple of gifts, things God gives us, things God grants to us, the strength, the faith. Um. And that we, or that ye, being rooted and grounded in love. And so love is something we're supposed to be rooted and grounded in. Love is something that's required for growth. It's something that's required for us to, to, to flourish in the Christian life. You cannot run your Christian life on responsibility, on fulfilling what is your duty on doing the job that needs to be done for the sake of taking care of business. You, you can't. The Christian life has to be fueled. It has to be rooted and grounded in love. Or it's, it's not going to succeed. It's not going to grow. You're not going to flourish. You're going to live a Christian life of resentment and bitterness and dryness. It's going to be something that leaves you withered and, 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 and dusty and and uh, and you know, and worn out, broken down, emotionally, physically, mentally, completely, you know, um, it's, it's just an unlivable life to try and live this Christian life, not fueled by love, love for Christ, love for one another, love for the world, as, as we're both commanded, but it's not just a command. Right? He's still talking here about gifts from God, things that, that Paul is praying that they would be granted. If we don't love one another, is that something we should be trying to do more of? Yes, to some extent. But more importantly, if you don't have a proper love for one another, it's something we should be praying for and asking God to give us. Because the, the source of love is not our effort, right? If I try as hard as I can to love those around me the way I'm supposed to love them, 
I will get better at it. And I'm not standing here saying we shouldn't be trying, we shouldn't be striving, we shouldn't be applying our own will to the, to the issue, uh, because we should. But understand that I, I don't have a source of love in me, in my nature, in my person, that's big enough for the love that God wants me to give to others. That love must be sourced from the love of God. And so um, when, we, when we look at this, that being rooted and grounded in love, this is not the love that we are capable of, the love that's innate in us, the love that... Um, that I have for my wife and my children, as big as that may be, is not big enough for me to then stretch that out and give a little bit of that to everybody in the church and give a little bit of that to everybody in the world. Um, the, the natural man's love is, is you know, eh, some, some people have more than others. And we've, we've all known people who are just naturally loving people, Right? And we've also known people who are not naturally loving people. And if I'm honest, um, I'm, I'm closer to the second category than to the first, right? That's just m in my nature, in myself, you know? I have a lot of love to give to my children. I have a lot of love to give to my wife. I've got a, a, a lot of love to give my, to my siblings and to my parents. Um, and in my nature, in my human flesh... That, that gets pretty close to the limit of it, you know? Um, I, I can start to run dry pretty quick. I got a few friends who, who fit that, that category. I've got my church family. And each successive ring you go out, and by the time we get outside the, the church family, in my nature, in my flesh, I'm pretty dr dried up, pretty done. I, I, don't, I just don't have a lot of love past that. Um, some people do. But no matter how loving a person is by nature, that's not enough. The most expansive, naturally loving person on earth does not have enough love to meet what God wants from us. The, the, at the end of the day, our faith must be sourced from God. Our strength must be sourced from God. Our love must be sourced from God. And when we're rooted and grounded in faith, then to go beyond that, to, to comprehend with all saints what is the breadth and length and depth and height. What's the song say? The love of God is greater far than any tongue can ever tell. It goes beyond the, the highest star and reaches to the lowest hell. Right? Right? O oh, love of God, how rich and pure, how measureless and strong, it shall forevermore endure the saints and angels' song. Um, that's the love that we're supposed to work to comprehend the measurement of. You, you know, the, the Bible doesn't, as far as I know, somebody can correct me on this, I don't think the Bible tells us to try to comprehend the, 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 the breadth and depth and length and height of God's judgment. I don't know that the Bible tells us, and, and we should be working and, at knowing God in every aspect. Don't, don't mistake me here. I, I, there's no aspect of God that we shouldn't be working to grow closer to and, and greater in the knowledge of. But in, in his love... We're supposed to try to live in that, to continuously, continuously grow in the knowledge of, to expand our understanding of, to work to every level, to recognize and to get to the end of it. We'll never get to the end of it, right? Who can measure the height of the love of God? Who can measure the breadth of it, the width, the depth? It's impossible. It's infinite. It's beyond all understanding. And in fact, he tells us that um, in the next verse. He says, to know the love of God, which passeth knowledge. He says, I'm giving you an impossible task, but it's an impossible task that will bless you as you strive at it. Because the further you go, the more you'll know the love of God. And it is a gift to us to know God's love to understand it, to live in it, to drink of it deeply, 
to take in as much as we can. And then when we have taken that in, to give it out. And see, when you take in the love of God to the, as much capacity as you have and more, you see that the only response to it is to give it. The only response to the love of God is to give of yourself. And when you give of yourself, fueled by the love of God, it's not a drain. It's not a frustration. It's not a, a trial or, or suffering to give. It is a joy to give. It is a relief to give. It is the, the only way to get more of God's goodness in you, to take that love of God and give it to others. And then you'll understand. And then you'll see why the Apostle Paul said, look, I don't want you to worry about how much suffering I'm doing for you. If you understand the love of God, you'll understand why it's a gift of God for me to be able to take this love of God that he's filled me with and to pour that out as much as I can because I can't do anything else with it. And if you're filled with the love of God as I'm asking and praying for you, then the same will be true of you. It says, to know the love of God, which passeth knowledge, that you might be filled with all the fullness of God. You cannot be filled with the fullness of God until you are filled with the love of God. You can't. We run dry in our Christian lives sometimes. If you struggle with depression, then you know maybe what I'm talking about. But I, I'm not going to diminish the, the, the dryness or struggle of people who don't struggle with depression. That's, that's not what I'm saying here. If you struggle with anxiety, if you struggle just with being tired, being weary, you run dry of love and caring. You run dry of, 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 of concern for others. You run out. You run out of being fueled by the Spirit. You run out of being fueled and powered by God himself. And you are instead running on the fumes of human strength. If you've ever experienced that, then one of the most important things to understand and to recognize is that what you need to be filled with is God's love. And you need to experience that in order to experience his fullness. You can't otherwise. And then it says in verse 20, I'm just about done. Now unto him that is able, or unto him that is able to do exceeding abundantly above all that we ask or think, according to the power that worketh in us. And so he talks about God and says God's able to do more than we could ever ask or think. He is able to do above all that we could expect, care about, or consider. In verse 21, unto him be glory in the church by Christ Jesus throughout all ages, world without end. We glorify God. Our lives are here for this purpose, to glorify God. We can only do that when we are fueled by him, filled with his fullness. We're strengthened with might by his spirit in the inner man. That, we, we, that Christ dwells in our hearts by faith. That we are rooted and grounded in love. That we comprehend or are working to comprehend the breadth and length and depth and height and to know the love of Christ. That we're filled with the fullness of God. When we do that, we will be a church that brings glory to God. He is the root and the source. He is the ground in which our tree grows, right? He is the river that, that waters us. He is the, 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 the source of fuel for our fire. He is all of that. We are not the source of any of this. We are not able or capable of being 
who we need to be in Christ on our own. We're just not. Not a single one of us. Not in any respect. But he is able to do exceeding abundantly above all that we ask or think. And he does that according to the power that worketh in us. Not according to us, not according to our power, but according to the power that worketh in us, which is his. And when we are controlled and fueled by that power, says unto him be glory in, in, the, uh, in the church by Christ Jesus throughout all ages. We can join the long line of Christians from here on back to Christ, from here through eternity, who, who will serve and bring glory to him when we are filled with his power. And so, um, you know, again, very, very simple, um, very st straightforward, I think. I don't know. Was that simple and straightforward? Um, we, we, need the, we need the power of God. And we're not going to do God's work the way that we're supposed to without it. We're going to faint at the things others do for us. We're not going to understand it when we're not fueled by his power. We're not going to understand what others do for us, what sacrifices people make. And we'll feel embarrassed or ashamed to receive the gifts of others. But when we're truly fueled by God, we'll, we'll recognize the gift that is given to them in giving to us, and in turn, we'll repay that by doing the same. We'll be fueled and, and fired up and rooted and grounded and strengthened by Christ. And that's all any of us could ask for, all any of us could hope for. Let's pray. Heavenly Father, I thank you so much for this evening. Thank you for all that you've done for us and all that you've given us. I thank you for your word. I pray that you'd work through it in our lives and, and use it. Um, Lord, use us, change us, speak to us this evening. Um, Lord, I, I don't know what you're what you're doing in in my heart, in my life, in other people's hearts and lives, in our church. Um, you know, you haven't given me that insight, but I I know that you are working, and that you are speaking, and that you are um, you are guiding and leading. And I I trust you, Lord. I trust you, even when I don't understand, even when I don't know what what y your uh, your will means, Lord, I trust it this evening. I pray that you bless uh, in Jesus' name. Amen. Heads bowed and eyes closed as Miss Maureen plays the piano. We're going to have a brief moment of invitation um, right here, right now. The altar is open. <laughs>